Okay, so Drupal infrastructure stuff. Things that you can do to a server and, and uh, that, that will help you scale and handle more users and more capacity. <coughs> One is Memcached. Memcached is a brilliant tool that is the secret plumbing behind almost every website you go to. They're running this little tool. It's developed, there's a company called Live Journal that was bought by Six Apart several years ago. The founder of Live Journal, Brad Fitzgerald, wrote this tool because he couldn't figure out ways to get his data to be cached locally on the server without having a duplicate copy of it on every web server. So if I cache all this stuff on every web server, and I've got 400 web servers, that's a lot of stuff I'm storing and a lot of extra stuff. And so what Memcached does is it stores in memory, spread across servers, figures out where the most recent copy is, what the, where, the, where the, the data is, and pulls it in. It is brainless caching in memory. It is, it is very, very complex under the hood. It solves enormous problems for lots of people. And, uh, and Brad Fitzgerald is a genius. Not just this, he's written a bunch of other things, but this is, this is pretty, if, if Brad Fitzgerald, he, he, most everything's written in Perl to start with, although Memcached, he, they rewrote the, the, the base engine in C for performance. But if he wrote an airplane in Perl and told me it would fly, I'd totally get on it and fly across the ocean. <laughs> this guy's a genius. Um, so Memcached is, is, is excellent. It is not a install it and go thing. You have to install the, the daemon, the memcached daemon, which is why the D on the end. You have to install that on your server. You have to configure it. You have to set up a server pool and figure out where your memcaches are and where your buckets are. Um, for Drupal, I suggest six buckets, and the memcached documentation, the, the module for Drupal actually explains those buckets, what they are, why you want six, and, and such. Um, basically, it's so that you have you can read and write to multiple buckets at the same time, and you're not blocking on each one. Um, it does require root access to your server to install it and get it going. So if you don't have that, this is kind of a deal breaker. Although, your ISP might already have it. It doesn't hurt to ask. Um, it, installed, it requires patches to Drupal core and to a couple of modules to get it to work. Does this basically become required or better when you have multiple servers, or is it also the it, it will still solve problems on a single server. Uh, because what it's doing is it's actually, all of those little caches we were talking about where Drupal grabs stuff and stores it in the database to be cached, your database is on disk. It's slow. I mean, it's you know faster than you are, but it's still pretty slow. Memcache takes all of that and stores it in memory. So memory is way faster than disk. And so you will see performance increases from that. You'll see more if you're running that on a, uh, if you have a separated database and web server, and you've got two different servers, because now you're also not making round trips to the database back and forth. You're not having to go across the network out to the database and back. Now your, your stuff is stored in memory locally. Um, but you still, you'll still see a performance increase on, on a single server. Um, it does eat RAM. It needs a lot of RAM in order to be effective. You're storing all this stuff in memory. So you need to allocate some good, some good amount of RAM to it. Again, the documentation both for Memcached and for the module explains how to do that. It does require installing those patch files, so it's not a drag and drop and copy and hey, I'm done. It requires a little bit of work. Next thing you can do infrastructure-wise. So infrastructure, this is all stuff you have to do to your network, to your servers, to how you're configuring stuff. So it doesn't work if I've got a $20 a month shared host and I have no access to anything. Uh, these are things that you're going to have to, you, you're going to require some extra stuff. A caching proxy, Squid, is a great caching proxy. And what it does is it sits in front of your web servers. And it takes all those requests that come in, and it reads them per user, per anonymous users, all kinds of stuff. It takes those, stores it outside of your web server, doesn't bother your web server with it. A request comes in that it knows how to handle it, it goes, yeah, I can do that. Don't have to bother the web server. The web server can do more important stuff. I'll just give that to this guy. So a caching proxy sitting out in front of your web server tier is huge. It requires some configuration to do. It's going to require some custom code in Drupal and in your templates to be able to set the correct cache headers. 
uh, so that you're, you're telling Squid what to cache, otherwise it becomes really ineffective with logged in users, and it, it does the same thing where it tries to cache something for an anonymous user that was a logged in user and tries to serve that, because it doesn't know any better. Scale your databases out. So, what we're talking about here is taking, splitting your databases away from your web server and getting lots of them, getting more, multiple database servers. This is not something that's possible within Drupal without making some modifications to the core. Um, so again, my caveat before, you really want to avoid making modifications to core because it's painful in the long term. But you know, this is something that's well known, well understood. It's a patch that's maintained for different versions of Drupal. So a new version of Drupal comes out, you can probably go download a new patch and install the patch. And, and you'll be back up to date. What this does is it allows your database servers, most apps, most websites that you've got out there are very read heavy. Most everything that hits your database and hits your, your site is reading from it and not writing to it. One of the reasons I suggest disabling that statistics module to keep that paradigm going, to make sure that it's reading and it's, it's, they're not writing to the database. If somebody hits a page, it doesn't have to write anything to the database to assemble it. It just has to pull data together and, and store it. You can, yeah? You said that there's a patch that's maintained uh, to, to scale databases. Yeah, the read-write split? Yeah. Yes. Is that the name of that? I, I believe it's called the master-slave patch. Okay. And it, you'll, you won't find it on Drupal.org currently. It's only being tossed around on the dev list, I believe, on the Drupal development list. It is something that is likely going to be in Drupal core for Drupal 7 or shortly thereafter uh, because it is a good idea and it helps large scale sites. So it's uh, it's something that's it's good and so they're adding it in. Yeah? The patch that you mentioned that's floating on the dev list, is that for 6 or is it both 5 and 6? I think it may be only 5 right now. I don't know if anybody's yeah. ported it to 6. Okay. Uh, so what it's doing is it allows all of your database queries that are writes to go to one server. And that's your master server. And with MySQL you can configure replication where everything that's written to the server, there's all these little slave servers sitting out there underneath of it that, that say, oh, you have new data, let me go get it. And so it maintains a copy of this data. It's read-only data. You can't write to there because now I've got two different databases that I'm writing to and you've got synchronization problems. Right, and you know, imagine trying to take two different disks, write the same data, write different data to both of them, and merge the two. It's kind of complex. So, doing the same thing with with uh, with databases. So, it's a MySQL master slave setup allows you to have multiple database servers out there that are being used for reading, and then one database server that's used for writing. And that's fine because again, the writing's happening very infrequently. Someone adds a comment. Someone adds a new new uh, node, someone, uh, hey, there's a light. Excellent, sorry. Um, somebody adds a, a new uh, user, that sort of thing. Those write, but most everything else that's happening on the site is reading. And so this allows you to spread your reads across lots of servers. If your server, your database server starts getting overloaded, starts having to work too hard, hey, I can spread the load out and let it run, run on multiples. So scaling databases out is one thing. Again, shared host, you don't have a choice. You don't have multiple boxes, you don't have replication, they're not turning these kinds of things on for you. This requires a little bit of network architecture work and a little bit of understanding about how MySQL works and, and setting that up. Offloading static content. So on your site, you've got these web pages that are being built, right? Every page is built by PHP, by Drupal, as it's going. You also have images, CSS files, user uploaded files, attachments, that sort of stuff that's sitting on your server. Stuff that's in your template that are, are, are uh, you know, stored statically somewhere. Your web server, every single time somebody hits Apache and, and makes a request to it, it has to spool up PHP and get ready to handle this request. I'm going to handle this big PHP request. Well, then it's not a PHP request, and it's kind of anticlimactic, and okay, yeah, here's this file. So it takes a lot of overhead to serve any file, whether it's 
a PHP page or, or not. The other thing about having the static content and everything coming from one server, server, a user's web browser can only request a few files at a time from one server. It's not going, hey, this page is made of 20 objects, I'm gonna request all 20. It doesn't do that. Request about four for most browsers at a time. And then those are done downloading, you request four more. Those are done downloading, you request four more. So now imagine that the page is being held up, that one of those requests is your, your web page. Apache is serving that web page process. Now a bunch more requests come in, and you've got 80 objects on this page, and four at a time it's requesting from Apache. And Apache's going, okay, I'm gonna serve this big, oh, no, I'm gonna serve this little file. And it's doing all that work to spin up and get ready to serve this big file, and it doesn't need to. So if you get that static content off, of your web server, off of your Drupal server, you can increase your, your performance. There's a couple of ways to do that. You can use a content delivery network. Akamai is the big one, and they're also the expensive one. Um, imagine you're not going to even, they're not gonna talk to you unless they're spending $15,000 a month with them. I yeah? Hear, I hear MySpace spends um, around, I the last I heard was 30 or 40,000 a month. Just for Akamai? Or? Yeah. That's fairly cheap. I'm Actually, surprised I it's not. Yeah, I, that, I may be underestimating that. I, I'd, be, I'd be surprised if that's not per day or per hour. Yeah. For my space. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. no, Akamai is expensive. Uh, there are others. There's a little one called Cashfly. Their base content delivery network service is 25 bucks a month. Who is that again? Cashfly. Okay. <laughs> Amazon is good too. So yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. So the difference between Content Delivery Network and Amazon though, is a Content Delivery Network actually takes those files and they don't just serve them from one web server. They serve them from lots of web servers so that A, your users can request more than four files at a time and your page will load faster. It'll look like it loads faster to them. Also, wait, A and also. That's like one, two, and C, right? <laughs> so we're actually working on a project where they've got four revisions, Rev0, Rev A, Rev B, and Rev C. So I, I don't know why they came up with this number in the scheme, but you know, there we go. Um, there's two types of people, one people that can count, and B, people that don't. Uh, so Content Delivery Network also sends that data out and sticks it on lots of servers, not just in their data center, but all over the world. And then they figure out what server is fastest for you. You hit the page, which server is fastest for you to deliver those? Which server is fastest for you? Which server is fastest for you? And it delivers those. It's excellent. It, it's speedy, it's quick, it does all kinds of nifty little things. Yeah? This is also good if you have a site where you're serving up a lot of rich media content. Yes, you're anything that's... Like a lot of videos, a lot of audio. Yeah, if it's real bandwidth you intensive... Offload that. offload that bandwidth somewhere else. Yes. Uh, that's the one place that Akamai or those types of places start to get a little cheaper. They can buy bandwidth a lot cheaper than you can. I guarantee you. They, they go to a bandwidth provider and say, we need more bandwidth. And the provider asks, how much would you like to pay for it? Um, so they're buying it a lot cheaper than you are. So those types of bandwidth services, over the long haul, if you're serving massive amounts of media and massive amounts of bandwidth, could be cheaper. What's, what's the process for getting those types of systems integrated into into a Drupal site. So I was going to get to that in a minute, but I'll talk about it now. When you upload a file, um, that file goes onto your files directory, right? And it sits there and it, it runs from there. Um, Drupal fetches that out of the files directory. It has no concept that this file might live somewhere else. So again, there's a patch, which hopefully will be rolled into, they're talking about rolling it into a, uh, a Drupal official Drupal release that allows you to specify, this is where my static files live. This is the web server, web address where my static files live. That way when Drupal builds the page, it's at least able to point to the right place. So that's half the problem. The other half of the problem is getting those files from there to the content delivery network. Big ones like Akamai and, and Limelight and those types, will actually, you put the file on your server, and the first time someone requests it, they'll say, I don't have that, let me go fetch it from their server, and that's done, and it's real simple to, simple to integrate. Otherwise, you've got an FTP or SSH, S copy up, there's all sorts of different schemes for getting them. That, that 20 something dollar a month cash fly one 
gives you an FTP server, you have to FTP things to it. There is a module for Drupal that, call, I believe it's called CDN, um, that will do that upload for you. So it'll take those files that get uploaded and it will upload the CDN. Things like module uh, CSS files and images and that sort of stuff, you'll need to move yourself manually, but you're not uploading those a lot. You know, you're, you're doing that once, okay, it's there, I don't need to worry about it with users doing it. Yes. So the core patch is, does, what it does is it tells Drupal, it lets you specify to Drupal my, the HTTP call, the URL that the browser should request, when I output the URL to this file, it should be over here. Instead of Drupal just does it right out of Drupal, it assumes that it's there. So how does it work with CSS uh, aggregation? You would have to manually copy those up. Now the CSS aggregation? That's stored in your files, right? That's stored in your files, yes. But it's not uploaded to the same process as a file upload, so I don't think the CDN patch is going to pick that up and move it. But it's not generated constantly, it's generated when you add modules, and it's, it's not something that's being copied. If you, if you never add modules, never make a change to your CSS files, you can take that cached file that it's got and upload it, and you're good. You can also use a second lightweight web server, so you can move your requests away from Apache and run it off another web server. It doesn't even need to be in another physical box. You can install uh, Lighty, uh, it's Light TTBD, um, or Nginx, N-G-I-N-X, because you know it would kill them to put a couple of vowels in there. Um, you can install those, and those are much, much lighter weight processes to start up. They don't require a lot of work. They don't have the PHP stuff built in. They don't have you know, mod security and mod, uh, all these other modules and all this overhead that Apache has. So they're faster, they can, they can respond quicker. You can move those onto there and that gives you a couple of things. One, those files are served a little faster. Two, you're, getting, you're not making Apache serve them. You're going to need to do the same thing with this as you would with the CDN. Well, the CDN patch will actually let you do this. So you install the CDN patch, you say, my files are on port 8088 on this same server, and so here's the base URL for that. And then you tell Nginx to use the same document root as Apache. So the files, every time they get uploaded, they just sit there on your, on your disk, and Nginx is just reading those files right in place. You don't even need to move them anymore. They're just sitting there and they're served right out of it. All you have to do is install the patch so that Apache knows, or so Drupal knows, these files should be installed or served from elsewhere. And you also have to install and configure Nginx. There's some other things you can do with rewrite rules to tell Apache. I've seen some people that have added rewrite rules to Apache that says if it's in the files directory, redirect it over here and serve it. The problem with that is you're really not gaining a lot. Apache's already started up so it can find those rewrite rules. So you don't get a whole lot out of that. And then the last one is S3. So Amazon will host your content on their servers in their data center really, really, really cheap. You can put the stuff there. You still have to, again, figure out a way to get it there. Files out of modules, um, CSS files, images, you can manually put up there. You need this core patch in order to tell it serve from S3 instead of serve from my local machine. So you still need to do that. The issue is uploaded files. There's no mechanism right now to send those uploaded files to S3. Hopefully in about a week that'll be solved. We're working on it right now. We're, we're building a module right now that will release to the community. We, we do very little module development that doesn't get released to the community. But we're working on a module uh, right now that will take uploads, will hook into the file upload, push it to S3 so it's available there for server. I know that other modules do similar things like Media Mover module. Media Mover, yeah, does some, has some components of that, yeah. Is there Probably not for the first revision of ours, because we're, we're doing it to solve a specific need, and we need it faster than designing an API will get us. Um, but yeah, that would certainly be a goal to, to provide something like that. Is your module of a name yet? Uh, no. Not as far as I know. I'm sure it has a name. I don't know if it's something that's even available on Drupal.org. 
you know, there's something we're calling it internally. I think we're just calling it S3 uploader. But probably without the E, just because, you know, we're all Web 2.0 around the corners and everything. So. <laughs>